Hello gang. So today I thought I'd give you a quick rundown of a couple of useful illustrations of sex determination. One reason for this is that sex is one of those areas of human interest that is rife with naturalistic fallacies. There are people who try to argue that this was the way that nature does it and therefore this is the right way and the moral way to do it while that other way is unnatural and therefore you were a bad person if you do that and that's invalid because uh, you can't derive an is from or an ought from an is and also what we're going to see is that there's a great variety of ways that nature says you can have sex another reason is that many people assume they understand sex determination if you inherit an x and a y chromosome you're a boy and if, you're, if you inherit two X chromosomes, you're a girl. But that's only true for a small subset of life on Earth. Uh, and it's also only true if you are defining things exclusively by gamete production. That there's a lot of different strategies within a sex that are also valid. So there's a variety of ways you can specify sex. And surprisingly, for something so fundamental to reproduction, evolution tinkers with it a lot. It's an amazingly flexible process. Or perhaps that should be unsurprising. All that the core of sexual reproduction cares about, all that matters, is that some individuals produce male gametes and others produce female gametes and that they somehow get together and fuse. How those gametes are made and how they get together is a fertile ground for playing games with pathways and processes. The importance of reproduction to the species means that all kinds of elaborate experimentation is normal as individuals constantly try to hone their skill, skills and their success rate, and as species try to improve their success rate as well. Even intentionally non-procreative sexual behavior is fine. It's play, it's practice, it's an opportunity for accidental reproduction. Sex determination isn't a behavior, though. It's how the set of pathways that lead to sperm production or egg production are activated. It's a side effect of sex, a common process in eukaryotes in which haploid cells are produced, which then fuse to produce a new diploid cell with a unique combination of alleles. Sex is common in eukaryotes, presumably because it generates variation for the sake of variation by recombination which can be a great benefit in changing environments. And also because it provides a mechanism to purge deleterious alleles from a lineage. But sex doesn't require sexes. You can have reproduction without males or females. So some organisms produce by isogamy. That is, all the individuals produce the same kind of haploid gamete and when the gametes meet, they fuse and produce a diploid individual. You don't need a distinction between sperm and egg in this case. Uh, they're identical looking, they just come together, fuse, and you've got a new diploid individual. This sounds nice. Anyone could reproduce with anyone else. A situation which also holds for hermaphrodites. Humans, however, are anisogamous as are most sexually reproducing species, and as are hermaphrodites. This just means that one kind of individual specializes in making small, cheap, numerous gametes, while another produces large, expensive, less numerous gametes, sperm versus eggs. These ex represent two extremes of mutually incompatible strategies for an individual investing little in numerous progeny or investing lots in a few and it seems to be the result of a common compromise to bo do both in different individuals within a species. How the sexes may have arisen in an isogamous species seems fairly straightforward. There's little point to sex if your gametes, your own gametes, just fuse with each other. So one thing that arose early um, are genes that specify mating types as a barrier to incest. So the idea is you should go forth little gametes, fuse with other gametes, but not with your, your each other, with your brothers and sisters. 
So here's the little genetic tag so that you can tell them apart. Uh, once you've got a genetic label for different mating types, it's a quick evolutionary race to start associating other properties with those traits. And before you know it, disruptive selection kicks in and you've got distinctively male gametes and female gametes. Okay, what I want to show you next is a very complicated figure. Okay, but it's useful. If you're teaching this stuff, I, f I think this is just a phenomenal illustration, even if it is a little garish. It's a schematic overview, overview of some sex determination mechanisms. So in this diagram, you'll see little arrows and you'll see things like M's. M refers to meiosis, producing haploid gametes, and F refers to fertilization. Uh, also, if you look closely at the little figures, uh, they have their haploid number inside them. So haploid stages are little n, one n, and are indicated by shaded areas. And diploid stages are n, n, so two n's, and are unshaded. So let's take a quick tour through this diagram. It's pretty elaborate. Uh, let's start at the top. So hermaphrodites. So most flowering plants, as well as gastropods and earthworms, contain both male and female sexual organs at the same time. So they are producing both sperm and ova. Other species, like many fish, some gastropods, some plants, are sequential hermaphrodites. What does that mean? That means clownfish, for example. You all know clownfish from the movie Finding Dory. Um, clownfish are born males and they can eventually change into females. There are also other fish species such as wrasses or gopies that begin life as females and then can later change to males. Another way you can do this is with environmental sex determination. Uh, these are species like turtles and some other reptiles that don't have distinct X and Y chromosomes. If you look at them, they're, they're homomorphic chromosomes everywhere. And sex is determined by, for instance, incubation temperature of the eggs. This is called temperature-dependent sex determination. In some other species, social factors can act as primary sex determining cues. So in this case, they use the example of uh, <coughs> the marine green spoonworm. Uh, if its larvae land on unoccupied seafloor, there's nobody around them, they'll grow up as females, which are larger, about 15 centimeters long. Uh, while larvae that is as they fall down bump into a female, develop into tiny males, which then move in and live with the female. <coughs> Actually, literally inside the female. Another mechanism, genotypic sex determination. Okay, this is the one you all know. This is the one you're totally familiar with. Almost all mammals and beetles, some flies, some fish, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> have male heterogamity. What does that mean? That means you've got XY sex chromosomes. This is the pattern you have you probably learned in high school. Meanwhile though there are other species such as birds, snakes, butterflies, some fish which are have he female heterogamity. Uh, that means that the different chromosomes, the equivalent of the X and Y are found in the female and the, the paired chromosomes are found in the males. Uh, in birds, these are called the ZW and ZZ chromosome types, just to distingu distinguish them from XX and XY. Uh, <coughs> there are also other patterns out there. So in mosses or liverworts, liverworts, excuse me, uh, separate sexes are found only in the haploid phase of the life cycle of an individual. So this is different from XXXY versus ZWZZ. So we've got to come up with some new letters for them, and that's why it's called UV sex determination. Uh, in some flowering plants and fish, such as the zebrafish, my favorite animal, 
Sex is determined by multiple genes. This is called polygenic sex determination. Uh, how does that work? Well, there's in, in XXXY sex determination, there's one specific gene that is important in specifying sex. Uh, the y, on the Y chromosome, there's a gene called SRY that's responsible for initiating male sex differentiation. Uh, in these kinds of polygenic animals, there's multiple genes. And what they do is basically add up quantitatively the arrangement of alleles they've got and whichever side's win side wins out numerically triggers a threshold and they develop into that sex. Okay. <clears throat> One you've also probably heard of is found in bees, ants, and wasps and that is called haplodiploidy. In these organisms, males develop from unfertilized haploid eggs, and males, oh, excuse me, females, uh, develop from fertilized eggs. There's also a pattern where, in, in scale insects, for instance, males inactivate or lo lose their paternal chromosomes. So this is a weird one. Uh, the end result is that males are going to be haploid, but they do that by some individuals literally throwing out all the genes that they acquired from their father. Uh, dad is just acting there to trigger development. In some species, sex is under control of cytoplasmic elements, such as intracellular parasites. So for example, in insects, there's um, a bacterium called Vol Volbachia. If it's infecting the egg, it's going to develop in one way. In some insects and some flowering plants, uh, there are mitochondria that are male mitochondria and female mitochondria, and depending on which ones you inherit, specifies what kind of sex you will have. This is cytoplasmic sex determination. And finally, in some flies and crustaceans, all offspring of a particular female are either exclusively male or exclusively female. So you can have male producing mothers or female producing mothers. Uh, this is called monogeny. There are other combinations that I'm not gonna get into here. There's lots of, there's lots of variety out there in the natural world. Uh, for instance, there are, there's, a, there's a phenomenon called uh, gynodiasi in which you've got a species where there are many hermaphrodites and a few females. There's also androdiasi in which you've got many males and a bunch of hermaphrodites. So in that one you don't have any females, any pure females, uh, you've just got hermaphrodites. Okay, let's wrap this all up, summarize it all. So this is uh, kind of a nice summary diagram that illustrates the range of different sex determination types in different lineages. As you can see, uh, under mammalia, we're all using the XY or the complex XY system of sex determination, whereas birds have flipped it around and are using the ZWZZ system. But look at the stock we arose from, look at the amphibia and the reptilia. They have all kinds of different forms. There's not, there's not one specific way associated with, a, with all species of amphibia or all species of reptilia. We can also see that insects have a diversity of patterns. Plants have a diversity of patterns. All these organisms are doing things in their own way. As I said, lots of exploration in nature of the different ways that you can specify sex in the development of an organism. Okay, you want to learn more, go read the paper. Uh, it's, it's publicly available, it's at PLOS Biology, it's called Sex Determination, Why So Many Ways of Doing It. You can go read that. Uh, there is also a website called The Tree of Sex. It sounds very exciting, but when you go there you'll discover it's very, very dry. Uh, it's basically a database that can be exported as spreadsheets that list all these different species and specifies number of chromosomes, how they interact, uh, how sex is specified in there. Uh, in addition, you can contact me at pzmyers at gmail.com or go to my website, freethoughtblogs.com slash 
Uh, I'm going to put the figures from this particular talk on that site. So if you're interested in teaching this stuff, there they are. Use them. Okay, thanks. Talk to you later.